Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome and greeting to all guests and visitors worshiping with us this day. The Council has the following announcements. The Council hopes to meet the Lord willing tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. in the church building. And Classes hopes to convene the Lord willing on March 6, 2018 in Coaldale. And the congregation is asked to submit any matters for Classes by January 30th. Our offerings today are for the work amongst the needy. So far, the announcement of the Lord. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Receive now the Lord's greeting, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us together praise God's holy name by singing from him five stanzas, one, two, and three. Let us now together with the church of all times and places make profession of our Christian and Catholic and undoubted Christian faith by looking at the words of the Apostles' Creed by confessing our faith according to these words and after let us sing together from the remaining stanza of hymn 5. Together we confess in our hearts, I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now approach God's throne and ask him for his blessing over our time of worship. Also in our prayer, we will remember the Reverend P.K. A. De Boer from uh, Australia, who is slated for open heart surgery uh, sometime in the next few months. We don't know, but we will remember him in prayer at this point in time. So let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we have gathered together once again in your presence, we give you thanks for bringing us here with the desire in our hearts to worship you. Lord, we recognize that this does not come from us naturally, but only from your supernatural work in our hearts by your grace and spirit. And so for this, we thank you, and we pray that we may therefore offer to you our wholehearted devotion and seek your Spirit to renew our lives more and more, that we may submit to you our God who is great and holy, holy, holy. We thank you for the peace and for the opportunity you give us to worship you as well as for the fellowship we can have also with each other. Lord, we are often not aware of how good we have it, not aware of how richly you have blessed us in giving us so much. For Lord, while we worship you here in this beautiful building, without fear or concern that our lives may be at risk, may be threatened, for our activities this afternoon. Yet there are others we know in this world who live in fear of persecution and can only worship you in secret. And we pray that you will provide abundantly for them. Grant them endurance and patience and undying love for you. And if it be your will, also cause their persecutors to turn from their wicked ways and allow the freedom of religion, the freedom of association, and the freedom of speech so that your people may worship you as freely as we can do here. Lord, we thank you for the knowledge we have of you. We thank you for the revelation of your greatness and glory all around us in creation on this beautiful day, also in your providence, in your preservation of this world from day to day and from moment to moment. And Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself further to us through your word. You've detailed for us your wonderful work of redemption in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will fill our hearts with great gratitude and with joy as we sing the praises of your name. Father, we also remember before you, Reverend P.K. A. De Boer, regarding the open heart surgery he is slated to undergo. We pray that you will give him and his loved ones peace in the lead up and preparation for this surgery. Give him peace of heart and give him peace of mind knowing that also his life is in your hands from day to day and from moment to moment. 
Lord, will you supply all of your servants with health and strength for their tasks? We pray also for all the office bearers of your church. Also, as they meet together this week, provide for them in their tasks and in their offices that they may carry them out faithfully and diligently and to the best of their ability and for the upbuilding of your congregation. Father, as we read your word this afternoon and as we focus our attention on the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, we pray that in doing so, we may become more willing, more dedicated, more emboldened to hallow your name above every other name in heaven above and on, on, the, and on the earth below. Lord, we pray that as we hear your word, we may receive it with true humility and with gratitude. And we pray that it may serve to make us grow in our life of faith and godliness, not for the glory of our names, but for the glory of your name. We pray all of this for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we prepare to open and read from God's Word this afternoon, let us sing from Psalm 93, all four stanzas. I invite you now to turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 17. We'll read together the first 26 verses. We read these verses in connection with what the church confesses in Heidelberg, in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 47, regarding the Lord's Prayer, specifically the first petition. Let us read together from John Chapter 17, Christ's High Priestly Prayer, 
as it is often referred to. We'll read together verses 1 through 26. Hear now God's holy and inspired and infallible word, which reads as follows. When Jesus had spoken these words, those are the words he spoke to his disciples, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, and they, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory, that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So far, our reading of God's holy word this afternoon. Let us now read from the church's confession as we find it in Lord's Day 47 of the Heidelberg Catechism, which we can find on page 561 in the back of our book of praise. (coughs) 
Verse 47, the question here is asked, what is the first petition? Hallowed be your name. That is, grant us first of all that we may rightly know you and sanctify, glorify, and praise you in all your works in which shine forth your almighty power, wisdom, goodness, righteousness, mercy, and truth. Grant us also that we may so direct our whole life, our thoughts, words, and actions, that your name is not blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. So far, the reading of the church's confession. After the proclamation of God's word, let us respond in song by singing from hymn 63, stanzas 1 and 2. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come this afternoon to the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. And the first petition, of course, has special significance because of its unique place and position in the Lord's Prayer, simply by virtue of the obvious fact that it comes first. For by placing this petition first, our Lord Jesus was teaching us something about what must be our highest priority, our greatest concern in prayer. It's not ourselves, but God and the hallowing of His name. And this falls in line with the other Lord's Prayer that we have in Scripture. Well, the other Lord's Prayer that we have in Scripture is the high priestly prayer that we read in John chapter 17 that our Lord Jesus Himself prayed. The primary focus of that prayer comes out right at the outset, also there in verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. His focus was for God to receive the glory. And along with giving glory to the Father, he prayed that he also would be glorified. In verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The glory of God was what was central to his prayer. Now to show you how striking this is, think for a moment of the following scenario. Uh, let's say, boys and girls, that there was someone who could give you anything that you wished for. If you could ask for anything in the whole wide world, what would you ask for? Of course, the answer that a five-year-old or a six-year-old child might give to that question would probably reveal their level of immaturity and their narrow ways of thinking. They might ask for their favorite meal uh, every day. Maybe it's pasta, that they love it so much that they want it for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. Or maybe in light of school resuming again tomorrow, they might ask not and, and maybe have an extended holiday where they can continue to do the things that they enjoy doing more around the home or playing outside. Those are the kinds of things that a young boy or girl uh, envisions would make them most happy in life and give them the, the greatest pleasure. But already by the time that one enters their teenage years, I think it's commonly the case that they realize that there's something immature, something foolish, inappropriate even, about that way of, of looking at life. As if life was all about our ease, our comfort, our enjoyment. All about self, all about self-indulgence. And so what every teenager comes to learn in the formative years of their youth as they grow up and as they mature is that 
they are not the center of the universe. It might be a hard and, and painful lesson, but nevertheless it is a necessary lesson to learn. Well, coming to learn that we are not at the center of the universe is a lesson we all must learn as Christians. And this is why the first petition is given to us, and also in the first place, to remind us of what we so easily, so quickly forget. That God is far greater than we are, for he is in fact the greatest of all. And thus, the most important thing we must pray for is that his name be hallowed. Therefore, I preach God's word to you this afternoon under this theme. In the first petition, we pray for God's name to be hallowed. We'll consider how this petition, first of all, convicts us, and secondly of all, compels us. First, we look at how this petition convicts us. When we speak about hallowing God's name what is it that we are talking about? Well, to start with, God's name does not merely refer to the names or the titles by which we refer to him, though they are important, though they have significant meaning. Rather, God's name is, is biblical shorthand, or if it is helpful for you to think of it this way, it's his personality profile for speaking of his whole reputation, his character, his being, and every part of it. In other words, God's name refers to God himself. And we are to hallow his name. Now, to hallow something means we are to treat it as holy. And holy means sanctified or set apart. Now we recognize that God is holy. We sang that earlier in hymn 5. We cannot make him any holier than he already is. So the point of the first petition is to pray that God's name be recognized as holy, treated as holy that all who stand before him would have a sense of reverence and awe in light of the, the magnitude of who he is, how great he is, how awesome he is, how wonderful and how powerful he is. We are to worship him with the same kind of reverence as we read, for instance, in, in the Psalms. Take Psalm 8, for instance, where the psalmist says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And in Psalm 19, as Psalm 19 puts it, the heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, heaven, earth, and all creation is resounding with that theme, God is glorious. God is great. Now the calling of the first petition is to live in the awareness of that. Now the reason we must pray this petition is because of the great tragedy that people do not hallow God's name. They do not sanctify, glorify, or praise Him because of His works, His wisdom, and His power. In fact, there are many people, and we so often, like them, do not treat God's name as, as weighty or as important, as, as something to be worshipped with reverence and awe. What happens instead is that at our heart's level, our desire is not to, to magnify God's name, but to magnify our own names. And so this petition convicts us of that awareness. And we, we need to have that, uh, that conviction. That conviction that the, the, the gravitational pull of my life, my consuming interest is, is to magnify my name over his. And we need to, to turn that around as, as the psalmist of Psalm 115 puts it, not to us, O Lord, 
not to us, but to your name give glory. We must discover that nothing else can give us satisfaction to our hearts. Not money, not prestige, not leisure, not family, not job, not health, not sports, not toys, not friends. Nothing besides God. And that is why we worship Him also today. This is the conviction that the first petition is meant to produce in us. The first petition is a prayer that God will, will first of all, open our eyes to see that He is central and indispensable and therefore worthy of worship. Only when He is central to our lives will we see that worshiping Him is something far greater than a, than a mere ritual, a custom, a tradition that we observe from Sunday to Sunday and throughout the week. Only when He is central will we understand that our songs and our prayers and our listening to sermons and, and all that we do in our order of worship is not a, a set of, of duties, but rather the means of, of coming to know and enjoy the fullness of God. Now, the, the focus of our worship must therefore be centered on God's giving to us and not our giving to God. For if that focus were the other way around, to our, our giving to God, then what we would find is that God is no longer at the center, but rather the focus becomes us and the quality of what we give, the level of our performances, the singing, the musical playing, the sermons appeal to our interest. And we forget that the reason that we are together is because God is indispensable. He is our greatest need, and we are here to, to hallow God's name. And apart from Him, we will be empty. We will be disappointed. No matter what we fill our lives with, we will, we will shrivel up and die apart from Him. It has been said that we live as we pray. Think about that. We live as we pray. It's true, isn't it? Our lives and our attitudes reveal much about the priorities of our prayers. Perhaps for some of us, if we listen carefully to our prayers, what we'll discover is that they actually sound like this. Lord, make my life easy. Make my life comfortable. Make my life safe. Make my life prosperous. Lord, may I have popularity and success. Lord, please do not let me suffer. Do not let me go through trial. Please, Lord, make my body healthy and strong. Please, Lord, do not bring me into adversity. Does that sound like how you pray? If you don't know, perhaps your children could tell you. But what happens when our hearts are, are tuned to the Word of God in the Scriptures is that we, we mature by God's grace and by the working of the Spirit. We recognize that we have a, a different set of priorities. And our prayers turn into, Lord, let your name be hallowed. In this connection, the great reformer John Calvin in his treatment on the first petition, in his book, The Institutes, says it is to our great shame that we need to be reminded to pray these words because there's something in our sinful human nature that rebels and, and resists the idea of honoring God's name. 
inherently in our human nature, we want the glory for self. And we seek the approval of others. And we have no regard for the God who made us for His glory. So it is only when we come to terms with our sinful nature and when we understand how prone we are to to think small thoughts of God and to have the, 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 the tendency to push God out of the picture of our lives and to live as though He did not exist, to act as if we determined our own fate, to act as if we could live by our own rules without any regard for the living God. Only then are we ready by God's grace and Spirit to recognize how appropriate, how good, and how necessary it is to pray for God's name to be hallowed. For without God's grace, creating in us a new, des- new nature with new desires, we would never do it. We would never be able or willing to hallow God's name. This brings us then to our second point, seeing how this petition compels us. Realizing full well that we are unable to hallow God's name on our own, in Lord's Day 47, the Catechism uses the words, grant us, not once, but twice, grant us. To, it uses those words to explain that in the first petition, we are calling upon God, we are requesting from Him to, to grant us the grace we need to hallow His name. And hallowing His name starts with knowing Him. Knowing Him is eternal life, as Jesus prayed in that high priestly prayer. Hallowing His name starts with knowing Him and knowing Him rightly. We want not just to have our minds filled up with with intellectual knowledge about God, but we are to have a deep and and experiential knowledge of God. To have that knowledge of God that, that trusts Him, loves Him, glorifies Him. Now where do we find this knowledge? Well, this knowledge can be found in what the Belgic Confession, Article 2, calls the two books, Creation and Scripture. As we heard earlier, the heavens declare the glory of God and and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Creation is is full of evidence, full of testimony of the, the knowledge of God. His fingerprints and and his footprints are everywhere to be seen everywhere we look not only at the at the end of of a telescope what we see through the telescope but also underneath a a microscope the the great and the small The, the weather systems the laws of gravity the laws of nature the the sun shining the rain falling But we are not only left with creation's witness, we also have clearer and fuller knowledge of God from His Word, from from His revelation. From His Word we learn that God is not a a distant and, and remote and impersonal God, but rather He is a personal God. One who comes close to us. Who speaks with us who stoops down to us and who cares for us as a father cares for his children. Now, to hallow God's name means that we are to, as the Catechism says, sanctify, glorify, and praise Him in all His works. That word, all, is so significant. We are not just to give Him the glory for some of His work, for parts of His work, but for all of His works, for creation, for providence, for His preservation of the universe, 
his preservation of our lives as well. A, a redemption. Our, the salvation of sinners. For every step along the way for our salvation, including our election, our justification, our sanctification, the, the sending of his Son, his suffering, his death, his resurrection and ascension, the sending of his Spirit to live in our hearts, to bring about the new life and conversion within us. Now those works are all significant, but when we pray that we may glorify God and hallow Him in all of His works, this also includes the things that we don't like. Even the things that don't suit us or, or our preferences very well. Even the things that are not at all pleasant to us. This is where the Christian faith is so radical, so countercultural, so powerful. It might be a disease or a sickness that invades our body, that brings with it pain, worry, maybe, maybe grief that brings sorrow, having a, having a significant illness that requires treatment with, with negative side effects, or it may be a, a debilitating illness or injury that, that prevents us from doing what we, what we so badly want to do. To pray for God's name to be hallowed is to pray that we may glorify Him in those situations. Even in the worst situation we can imagine, when the road is tough and when the road is long and it doesn't appear to be coming any closer to its end or getting any smoother as we go. This is how believers who face terrible persecution, even martyrdom, the loss of their lives in, in times past, were able to face the worst that was brought upon them. And they were able to endure and, and even to give a powerful witness to their faith. For if we, if we really took this petition seriously to heart, I hope we will this afternoon, then we will be filled with great boldness for God. In fact, we would be the boldest people on the face of the earth. For in the face of adversity, in the face of losing everything that you own materially, following the Lord would, would win out over everything. And everything else considered lost for the sake of Christ. And so there is also then a great contentment, a great peace that we have, even in times of adversity, even in times of great loss, that there is this poise, there is this calm, this assurance that God is in control. And if He is in control, then I can trust Him no matter what He brings me, for He will bring me through this. And He will bring me out of it, if it be His will, or He will make me even stronger through it than I was before. Well, some have said that, that this, that, that this is the, the third book that reveals who God is. We heard about the other two earlier, creation and scripture, but there is also a third book, which is your life and mine. And this book, this is the book that the unbeliever reads the most carefully. And it may be the only one of the three books that they are reading closely. And when they read the book of your life, they look to see if you are, are truly hallowing God's name truly setting it apart, truly living a life that, that stands out from others in this world. And if they don't see any difference, if they see that the one who prays for God's name to be hallowed but won't lift a finger or, or apply any effort 
to see that happen, to see God's name be hallowed, then all that person is doing is causing God's name to be blasphemed, to be dragged through the mud. And so the first petition really touches on every part, every area of our lives. It has, it has been called a missionary prayer, a prayer that we will be compelled to witness well for God in all that we do. As the Catechism says, it's a prayer that we may so direct our whole life, our thoughts, our words, our actions, that God's name is not blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. So this has practical implications for us. Implications for how we do business. Implications for how we earn a living. How we worship God. How we show up to church on Sundays. And how we sit in the pew. And how we sing. And how we worship. How we raise our children. Also, what we read. And what we watch. And what we listen to. Also, who we associate with. Who we date. Who we marry. How we treat the Lord's Day. In short, in everything we say and do and think, we must see to it that God receives the glory. But because we cannot do this perfectly, because we cannot hallow God's name perfectly, that is exactly why we must pray this petition and pray it regularly and pray it passionately. And we must look to Christ who did hallow God's name perfectly in everything he did in word and deed. And yet, the greatest irony of all is that the one who hallowed God's name perfectly was the one who was condemned for doing exactly the opposite. Being put to death under the charge of what? Of blasphemy of God's name. Though it wasn't for his blasphemy that he was ultimately put to death. He was guilty of no sin. But it was for your sin, for my sin, your blasphemy, my blasphemy, was the reason why he died. And so as those who have been redeemed through his death and resurrection, those whom he is redeemed to save, let us be thankful for his deliverance. And let us also pray with heartfelt longing, hallowed be your name, and let us live as we pray. Amen.
Let us now give thanks to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Grant us, we pray, first of all, that we may rightly know you and sanctify and glorify and praise you in all your works. For, Lord, in them we see shining forth your almighty power, your wisdom, your goodness, your righteousness, your mercy, and your truth. Grant us also, we pray, that we may so direct our whole life, our thoughts, our words, and actions, that your name is not blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. Lord, we pray that the holiness and the glory of your name would affect everything that we do, everything that we say, and everything that we think, so that our whole lives may be a reflection of our prayer, and our prayer a reflection of our whole lives. We pray that this would be true for all of us in our daily vocations. Be with those who labor in the workforce. Be with those who labor in the home. And be with those who will be heading off to institutions for learning again tomorrow. Be with the students and teachers, the staff and all who volunteer, so that they may all return to their tasks rested and refreshed and eager to resume their tasks and callings for your glory. We pray also for the students and teachers at our seminary in Hamilton as classes also resume there and also with a view towards the conference to be held there later this week. We pray that you will bless all the endeavors, all the education, that goes on there at our seminary so that all who study there may be well trained, well equipped in order to handle the Word of God rightly and effectively and faithfully. Lord, we pray also that you will supply good health to students and professors alike. And we pray that you will also provide more men who have the desire to study your word and to share its riches in the work of gospel ministry. Lord, you tell us in your word that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we pray that you will send more workers out into the harvest so that all of your people from all over this world may be gathered in by faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, as we look forward to this week, to whatever it may bring, we pray that in whatever our circumstances may be, that we may offer up our lives in your service and for your glory, where all else may be considered as loss for the sake of Jesus Christ. We pray all of this, not because we are worthy or deserving, but only for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to worship him with the offering of your gifts, and after the offering has been collected, then let us stand and sing together from hymn 78. Hymn 78, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, all stanzas of hymn 78.
Lift up your hearts and receive the blessing of the Lord and go your ways in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.